magnetism, as if we were witnessing a novelty from the 19th century. This work of investigating and disseminating secret human powers compromises an invaluable aid in both present and future educational endeavors. It is important to remember that this spiritual endeavor is nothing new. During his passage on this planet, Jesus was the individualized sublimation of personal magnetism in its enchanting presence, and the crowds followed him, touched with singular admiration. Nearly everybody sought to touch his clothing. Radiations of love emanated from him, neutralizing recalcitrant illnesses. The master spontaneously produced a climate of peace that reached anyone who enjoyed his presence. Thus, if you seek an easier way for the full blossoming of your psychic potential, it is reasonable to take advantage of the experiences that earthly guides offers you. But do not forget the examples and living demonstrations of Jesus. If you intend to attract, it is imperative to know how to love. If you desire true influence on earth, sanctify yourself through the influence of heaven. For reflection about today's reading, in today's reading, Emmanuel reminds us that although we did not know about personal magnetism, it has always existed in us as something innate. So it is not new to the human being as such. We have the example of Jesus who was the sublimation of individualized magnetism. Am I aware that I possess a magnetism that can be very useful for the good of our fellow men? as in the case of magnetic passes that we receive. Am I offering this personal resource for the benefit of our neediest brothers? Prayer. Okay. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity of being here today with our brothers and sisters. Thank you to our spirit guides and guardian angels for always being by our side. We pray for all those that are sick, in hospitals, in nursing homes, and in prisons, in orphanages. And we pray for peace in this world and throughout the universe. So be it. Today's lecture is by Alan Sabrera, Chapter 8, Blessed are the Pure of Heart. I think that's better. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for all coming this morning. So today I'm speaking about the blessed of the pure in heart, chapter eight. One second. Thank you. Thank you so much. So today's chapter is Blessed and Pure in Heart, the Gospel according to Spiritism, Chapter 8. Today is a very special, um, t uh, what's the word I'm trying to look for, presentation for me today. For the simple reason is uh, I invited my daughter to do this with me. So while I was writing the PowerPoint, she was there reading the book with me and looking for images. So this presentation is a dual effort by, by me and Kiara. So, thank you. Let the children come to me. When Jesus said that the children come to me, he was speaking about children who are very young, children who have not yet reached a level of maturity that understand what it is to come into who they are from a previous existence. So when Jesus said, let the children come to me, he was talking about simplicity and humility. We are all born with that because we're all born with our memories suppressed, or if you want to say erased. But as we get older, our memories may not be coming back to us, but our habits, our characters do. And during this process, we become an adult. 
little by little. And then depending on level of evolution, that simplicity, humility, either slowly moves away or slowly increases and gets stronger. So when Jesus said, let the children come to me, he's talking about all those who have not yet reached that level where they have not, they have not shed their innocence yet. They're not shed their love. But it also means exclude every evil thought. For most children, when they're playing with their brothers and sisters, they don't have a thought about, you know, let's take this from me, take, you know, that belongs to me, that belongs to that person, I wanna share. But obviously, as we get older, this all changes. But that's when he says, let the children come to me, because he's trying to put, portray an example, portray what it is to be a child, portray what it is to be loved with, without an exception, without a clause. This is not a contract. Love is pure. And as I said, this does not only mean children. It means those who act like those who are children, those who have love, humility in their hearts, and no other evil thought. Not anger, not envy, not lust, not pride. The kingdom of heaven is for, for those who are like them. So that's what he, it's not, he's not saying that nobody's allowed in heaven that's not like a child. But what he's saying is that's what he wants for every one of us to at one point within our evolution to become pure in heart pure in love, simple, humble, not judging, no preconcepts. And if you look at this image, you see all the different children surrounding him. I thought it was a beautiful image to show how much he loves us. And, this, and even though it's saying let the children come to me, it's these children, as you see, they're playing. Nobody's thinking of war. Nobody's thinking of anger. Nobody's thinking of lust. Nobody's thinking of envy. They're just enjoying themselves. Simple. While, while we're young, we need special care, especially of our mothers. This is another reason why our memory is suppressed. Because in order for our mothers to love us, but truly love us, they must not have any preconcept of who you were because how can your mother truly love you and put all her everything into you if she knew that maybe you were someone extremely bad in another life, something that you may you have done. And that's why a mother's love is so pure. Not only did you come from your mother and God given her the beautiful gift to deliver you, but because she will love you more than any other person on this earth. As you can see, my wife and her two children. <laughs> this is when my son was, when she first gave birth to my son, and she was there happy, creating both of them. I was looking for a, ch a child and a mother, and I figured, why not use my own wife? <laughs> children need love from their mothers in order for them to wean out bad habits of their past lives. Now, it is a job of the parent to raise their child especially from the mother, because a mother's effect has a stronger impact than a father usually. But as parents go, we're not perfect. We also make mistakes. And as our children grow, their true characters come out. That being said, all we could do as parents is do our best to be patient, do our best to love no matter what happens, because we could do our best, the child still may astray. But if we keep praying and keep having patience, they will in their own time come back. Children are angels in their mother's eyes. And raising two children on my own, <laughs> I can say that my eyes are loving but logical, whereas my, my wife's eyes are truly loving with no logic involved. <laughs> whereas I'm quick to say what's right and wrong, and in mommy's eyes, it's not the same way. So all mothers, that's why mothers are, are truly blessed and, and the children to have mothers are blessed 
because they're loved no matter what, no matter what they do, no matter what they say, no, no matter the mess they make. It's unconditional, as Maggie said. Mark 8, 27 to 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now, when Jesus spoke in parables, it was so hard to understand them. I think that's why many of us strayed from the Catholic Church or the other Christian churches, because they tell us to study, study, study. But if we can't comprehend or grasp what we study, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help us evolve. But through Spiritism, the Gospel according to Spiritism, in chapter 8, explains here why. Because sinning and thought is what causes us to perform the action. See, our thoughts become words, which become deeds. We're not perfect, but we could fight those thoughts. We could ask forgiveness for those thoughts. We can try our best to not let those thoughts manifest themselves into words, into deeds. But our thoughts are different from our actions. Are we held culpable for our thoughts? Yes, indeed. So if you think that because you didn't say anything out loud or perform an action that God does not hear and see, that your guardian angel and mentor does not hear and see, they do. That's why I know for me, when people say, Alan, you're a good man, I'm like, you don't know my thoughts. Every day is a battle inside my head for my thoughts. But that is part of evolution. As long as we do our best to combat our thoughts, we are making progress. And God loves us for that. As long as we make progress somehow, some way, we're doing the right thing. But if we let those thoughts continue to happen without asking forgiveness, without trying to change, without combating it, then we are just as culpable if we said the words out loud. We're just as culpable if we perform the action. But do we suffer the consequences of evil thought if it isn't followed by an effect? Yes and no. Yes, <laughs> if you're studying spiritism and you're reading the, the book, it explains to you in the language of your choice exactly what it means to commit a sin, exactly what it means to do right and do wrong. Those of us who don't understand that thought is sin, and we're not really held by the consequences by it because we don't really grasp it yet. But for those of us who come here every day or a couple times a week or study other religions who speak about this, like Buddhism, you do understand that our thoughts have an effect and that we must do our best to change them. But the answer to this is yes and no, all depending on your level of evolution and your understanding. But as you see, the deadly deadly sins that my daughter found yesterday, <laughs> pride, lust, envy, wrath, greed, sloth, and gluttony. All these thoughts usually do control what we do in a day-to-day. -day. Whether we're gluttony, we, we want everything we see and we just go for it. Lust, where we look at other women and men with the eyes of that you want them, not just that they think they're beautiful or handsome. Pride, where you think you're the best in the world no matter what, no one can say otherwise. Sloth, where all we do is just sit down and just do nothing all day. Greed, where all you think is about having the riches, which is almost also synonymous with gluttony in some ways. So you just want everything, what you see, what you don't have. Wrath, anger, envy, which can lead to wrath. You want what others want. Now these thoughts, a lot of times manifest into words. And if you look at your day to day, whether before you're spiritist, whether you're born into spiritism or not, whether you're a spiritist today, these sins come in every one of us. But let's just do our best to combat it. Do our best to ask for forgiveness and really mean it. Oh, too fast. Sin can make you sick. 
Now, when I found this picture, I did. I wanted to kind of like erase the sin. I wanted to put like bad thoughts, but I'm not that great at Photoshop, so I just left it the way it was. But if you think about it this way, when you're always angry, always depressed, always envious, always asking the wise me, you're probably always getting sick. You're probably always in need of some type of medicine for your mental health, for your physical health, because bad thoughts lead into you becoming physically sick. Positive thoughts lead to love, health. So when you ask yourself, you know what, I'm not ready to forgive. I'm not ready to make this change, or I'm not the level of evolution to make a change. Well, maybe you think that this just affects you mentally. This affects you physically. So if you think that you cannot make this change for who you are mentally, because it's not who you are, then make this change for yourself physically, because you're gonna get extremely sick as years come along. But if we do our best to combat our evil thoughts, then we're finally moving in the right direction. You see, we're not perfect, and we'll come back and come back and come back many, many times. But as long as we're trying our best to combat it, we are making a move forward. Our guardian angel, our mentors, God is happy with us because we're trying. See, it's always hard to do good because it, for most of us, we have to try to be good. Some of us who are truly blessed, who have been through the evolution already, it's easy to be good. For the good portion of us out there, it's not easy to be good. It's easy to commit sin. Romans 6.14, as his picture, sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. When you're at that point where you're combating your thoughts day in, day out, you're not governed by these evil thoughts. That means you're pushing away what? You're pushing away baggage from previous lives. You're shedding this baggage. You're pushing away these negative spirits who want to bring you down because you're combating them every day. So you're no longer held by the sin. Some people feel they're held by sin. Some people feel that no matter what they do, something bad happens. Well, guess what? That will change. But you have to change who you are. Don't expect change to happen if you're gonna stay the same person because that, then no change is gonna come. I saw this picture that I thought was beautiful. Karma cleanse. Be grateful, act with love, check your motives, watch your attitude, and forgive. I mean, this is, I mean, this is beautiful because even if you weren't a spiritist, even if you believed in zero religion, but you believed in morality, you're actually on the right path. And if you're, if you're trying to change who you are, by like being grateful every day for everything you receive, for what you have, do your best to act with love, check what your intentions are, keep your attitude calm and forgive. You are on the right path. You don't have to be a spiritist. You don't have to be in any religion to do that. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to teach us, is that to change morally, move forward, Love. The most beautiful thing in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. How beautiful is that? True purity and unclean hands. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Many of us judge from the outside without taking consideration of what's in the inside. In Judaism, they expect you to wash your hands before you eat, and it was a great sin to them if you did not. But Jesus said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You care so much about the outside, but you do not care about the inside. So if we're not doing our best to change who we are from the inside, meaning our spirit, our soul, our heart. What does it matter if our hands are dirty or clean? What does it matter if we went to the plate besides the fact that you may have germs in your hand, you may get sick, but that wasn't the point of this teaching. The point of this teaching, at least from Jesus, is that change who you are morally. When you go outside and even by accident, you see somebody dressed in a way that may not be 
right in your eyes and you say, look what she's wearing, just ask forgiveness real quick. Okay, we're not perfect, right? But truly ask forgiveness. Just try. And you see that you're actually washing internally. You're washing who you are. You are shedding that old you. Little by little, you're shedding the old you. It is not what goes into the mouth that defies a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. It is not what goes into the mouth that makes a person unclean. It is what comes out of the mouth that makes a person unclean. Because our thoughts manifest into words. And this is what Jesus is trying to portray to us in this parable when he was speaking to the teachers of the law at that time. So you could do your best to dress in those fancy robes. You could know every word for word of, of the Quran, of the, I'm sorry, of, the, of the, the Jewish Bible. Sorry for saying that. You could know every, you could be the smartest person in spiritism. You could know, you could know every parable. But if you don't truly have love in your heart, love in your spirit, then what are you doing? Because we need to work our best to help each other. Work our best to move forward. Because every one of us are at a different level of evolution. Some of us are smarter. Some of us are not as smart. Some of us, this comes with a snap of a finger. Some of us has to try extremely hard. Every one of us at our different level and every one of us needs assistance in a different area. And if we all did our best to work hard, to help each other in the way that we need and come together as a unit, as a family, then we're truly making progress at that point in time. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Matthew 15, 7 to 9. So how true is that? You can have the most beautiful words in, in a thousand different books. But if, you could, but if you could remember every line for line, then you could also change who you are. Because if you became intelligent first, then love is second. But if love came first, then intelligence is second. But you need both in order to truly move forward. You need an equal amount of intelligence and love in order to move forward. One without the other is not complete. One without the other can cause pain. Let's talk about scandal. Now, I had to reread this part a few times, but it made sense after like the fourth time. Even my daughter had a problem understanding it. If your hand has caused a scandal, cut it off. Our master did not believe that we should grab a machete and just chop off the hand for a stealing or doing something wrong. But we're not at a stage of evolution in this world that where everything is perfect. We are in a stage of evolution in this world where there is a cause and effect. Certain things need to happen. Certain calamities, certain sins must happen in order for us to grow, in order for us to learn, and for order us to learn our lessons from the mistakes that we continuously make some of us could, hit, could be hit by a train once and we'll remember that and we won't per, um, make the same pro, um, problem again. But some of us, you have to hit us and hit us and hit us and hit us and we still don't change. But we will change once we get tired of getting hit, <laughs> right? But what he's trying to say is with that thought, if you're not combating it, it becomes words, then it becomes action, you need to cut it off before it hits the action. You need to cut it off before it becomes the word. At the thought, cut it off. So even though scandal is needed in order for us to grow in this particular life, in this evolution, we are still held responsible for the scandals that we commit. Because you could read it in such a way, say, well, it's saying that we have to cause it because some of us have to grow. Well, yes and no. Yes, scandals are needed. But don't think that because your scandal helps somebody else grow, that you're not going to pay for the scandal that you caused. So even though it's needed, let's work 
to not make them happen so that this level of evolution could progress even further and this planet become pure so that we don't have to commit sins in order for us to grow. If anyone causes a scandal to one of these who believe in me, it would be better for him if one of those millstones were hung around his neck and that he were cast into the depths of the sea. When Jesus spoke, you know, he, he spoke with such authority, kind of scary sometimes, <laughs> when, 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 when uh, he says, throw a millstone around the neck. But again, what he's saying here is, do not lead the children. Do not leave someone who does not know any better. It doesn't have to be a child. It could be an adult. But do not lead them into sin. Do, not, do your best to, to not bring others with you down. If you're sinning, let it be you sin for yourself. Do not cause others to sin. Because that's what he's saying to you. Because then you're double at fault. Do not put your problems on others. Work. Ask for help. But don't move others to commit the same sin that you're doing. Because that's what he's saying. Love each other. Work hard. Care for each other. Do not cause one of my children, and we are all his children, to sin. So what Jesus says doesn't literally mean cut off a part of your body. It means that whatever crime you commit, it will affect you more than others. He was always trying to save us through these parables, and sometimes his harshness was to scare us, to scare us into doing the right thing. Sometimes those parables were like, okay, yeah, let me not do this because something bad is going to happen to me, right? But that's where um, the gospel according to spiritualism comes into play. It translates these parables, sometimes scary parables, sometimes can't understand them parables, to something that's meaningful, something that's understanding, something that we could actually do in this lifetime to make a change. Fight the urge to commit your sins. I mean, this is, whenever this chapter over and over, I think this is the, the most important thing that I got. We're not perfect. We're going to commit sins. Just fight it. You know better. You're reading. You're learning. You're understanding. Don't let it be in vain. Don't read to, do, to just read. Don't read to just be intelligent. Move to action. Change who we are. If only our eyes saw souls instead of bodies, how very different our ideals of beauty would be. Sometimes, especially reading the final aspect of the Spirit's teachings, a blind person is truly blessed. They don't judge you by how much money you make, by the car you have, by the clothes you have, by the jewelry you have, by the facial features, by your weight. If they judge you at all, they judge you by your character. How, how beautiful this world would be if every one of us would judge each other by the character. How beautiful this world would be if we looked at each other's spirit and soul, not this costume that we wear every day, all day, that we're changing 20 times a day to fit the people that we're around. How beautiful then would this world be? That's why blessed are the blind because they truly will be pure in heart because they are not going to judge you with any other preconcept. But that being said, blindness is not necessarily, you know, meant for every one of us. It's part of evolution. It's part of sometimes of what we learn through spiritism from acts of previous lives. If the whole world was blind, how many people would you impress? Buna Muhammad. So everybody's taking selfies. Everybody's trying to look beautiful. Everybody's trying to be, you know, a person that impresses everybody else. But if we're all blind, what do we need to impress? What would be the point? None. Because we can't see each other. But we can feel each other. Feel the energy around us. And then from there, we can know each other's beauty by our character. Kindness is a language that deaf people can hear and that blind people can see. But for those of us who can see and hear, 
usually we brush off kindness because we're too we too care too much about our selfishness and our pride to care about the kindness of others we care too much about ourselves and what we need and what we want and do not see what the kindness in front of us the people are doing for us is actually happening because we're too caught up in ourselves but a blind person doesn't worry about that this quote from Samuel Butler was kind of hard to read but it makes sense a blind man knows he cannot see and is glad to be led though it be by a dog but that is blind in his understanding which is the worst blindness of all believes he sees at the best and scorns a guide which is saying a lot those of us who can see think we know the best think we know what's right don't help us we don't need you I can do it by myself too much pride blind person says thank you thank you for guiding me whether you're a dog or a human a cat whatever thank you I appreciate it blindness took away my sight but gave me clarity of vision it took blindness to teach me the meaning of love and friendship it's amazing how calamities to ourselves changes who we are how something so drastic can happen to us and if, for most of us it changes some of us we still stay in self-pity and we walk and we wallow until the day we die physically into the spiritual land but for most of for some of us a catastrophe changes us for the better sometimes makes us more humble sometimes makes us less pride prideful sometimes makes us more loving sometimes lets us see what we don't see already around us it removes that veil of, of non-understanding and that's why you hear love is blind because if you truly love everyone if you love Jesus you love God if you love your neighbor like you love yourself then truly love is blind you're not gonna care the sins that they commit whether in this life or the last whether you can see every past life and every sin that everyone committed, it wouldn't matter if you had true love. And that takes a long time to, to achieve, but we could try. Every day, we could try. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of faith and for allowing me to see your miracles. Amen. I mean, that's probably the proudest our Father could be of us because we're acknowledging every day is a gift every day is a blessing usually every night before I go to bed or sometimes in the morning I wake up and I say Lord you gave me a son a daughter a wife a house a car a job you gave me more than I could ever ask for you gave me more than I truly deserve in this life please forgive me the sins I committed yesterday today and in the past Thank you so much for all that you've done for me. I know sometimes I get overwhelmed, but you only do this because you know what I can handle. So all we need to do is just accept the fact that he loves us, accept the fact that what he gave us, we can indeed handle. But we're never alone. We're receiving help day in and day out. We just tend to think that we're not receiving this help. We tend to think that we're all alone by ourselves, but we're not. The Lord is there for us day in and day out. You are never alone. Thank you for listening to the presentation. My daughter and I worked pretty hard on it and enjoy the passes to come next. Th thank you for having me. Time for the prayer. Lord, Thank you for allowing me to have another opportunity to deliver a message from the teachings that you've given us over 2,000 years ago. Lord, thank you for allowing all of us to wake up this morning. Thank you for all the beautiful treasures you have given us, food, love, whether it be from a parent, from a friend, from a relative, or even prayers from people that we don't know. Lord, we thank you 
for this life, for all the obstacles you've given us, because it has made us who we are. It has made us to what we're gonna be. It's gonna continue to help us grow, to continue to strive for the better mor morality. Lord, we ask that you strengthen our spirit mentors, our guardian angels, for their job is not easy. For we tend to be deaf to their suggestions and blind to what's right in front of us. But with your guidance through them, we will achieve what you ask of us. And that is to love each other with all our hearts and soul as we love you. So be it. Thank you.